Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to my Doc Digest episode, Monday, three years ago, 16th Monday. Today is May, it's the day, Friday, 19th. Welcome to the Doc Digest We would like to share a prayer with all of you who risk it all to seek and share truth for the betterment of humanity. This broadcast is brought to you in part by Eternal Affairs Media and DarkDocs.com. Welcome to Dark Docs Digest, episode 23, a Gray State special with uh, Dan Hennon and Greg Fernandez Jr., who were in the Netflix documentary, A Gray State. Uh, Greg Fernandez Jr., of course, has been on the show several times. Uh, He's one of the co-creators of Resist the Grove, and he was in our documentary, They Are Here to Save the Worlds. Uh, when we went to the Bohemian Grove last year, and we're going to be meeting again with him this year. And now we have uh, one of uh, Eternal Affairs Media's new talents, uh, Dan Hen, who is also in the Gray State Netflix documentary. Oh, wait, I got a little feedback here. Hello. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, if you guys want to uh, kick this thing off, you guys are the experts. I've been spending hours, if not days, on all of your research. It's just endless, it feels like. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Uh, start things off if you if you want. Um, sure. I mean, I guess uh, uh, for anybody that doesn't know about this case, we have David Crowley. He's a film filmmaker. He was a former U.S. soldier. He was working on a project called Gray State. And on January 17, 2015, his body, his wife's body, and his five-year-old daughter's body are all found inside of their home in Minnesota in Apple Valley. And that's where it all starts. And um, from there, it gets pretty damn crazy. Now, you would think that three bodies in this house for what could be one week, two weeks, three weeks, we really don't know. There really is no time of death. But you would think that that would be the craziest part of this whole story, but that's where the whole thing starts. And from there, that's when things get really crazy as far as trying to find the truth to what happened. Were they murdered? If David Crowley is guilty of killing his family, why do we not see any evidence that points towards that? Why are there so many people that are so certain that David Crowley is guilty, that they will go to such lengths as to make threats, as to cyberbully, to play games, to do all of these things that truth seekers don't do, to do all of these things that real people are not supposed to do. Why has there been so much games? Why has there been so much drama when all we're asking is one simple question? Where is the evidence that proves David Crowley guilty? I don't think that's a, that's a big question. I think it should have been a simple question for the media, for the alternative media, for the family, for the, for the friends, but most importantly, for the, in, for the investigators. None of them can answer this question. In this country, you are innocent until proven guilty, and David Crowley has never been proven guilty. Therefore, he is innocent. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree. This is Dan Hen, and I created the uh, Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook page uh, back on January nineteenth, two thousand fifteen, two days after the bodies were discovered. Um, a- after first hearing the official uh, narrative, I knew something was was up. None of these stories seemed to make sense. Nothing added up, and I wanted justice for this family. David was twenty nine years old. 
uh, in shape, uh, healthy guy, uh, working on a lot of projects. And his wife was uh, Kamel. She was 28. And then they had a five-year-old daughter, Rania. And all three were found dead uh, from a gunshot wound um, in the head in their house. And the bodies were laying there after Christmas, they think, up until three weeks before the bodies were found. None of the neighbors um, heard any gunshots. There was no problems with the family. Uh, David had just signed a a, uh, a deal with a Hollywood producer to uh, make his story, his script, into a movie or a web series or a television series. Um, one of the options, they were still finalizing that, uh, but it hadn't come to fruition. And then his well, wife uh, started an at-home business and was in the process of uh, putting together, possibly writing a book on dietitian uh, uh, nutrition and whatnot. And then the daughter was in kindergarten. And so all three were found. Uh, and we're talking over the Christmas holidays is where we start finding out that there was no welfare checks by family, friends, neighbors, or relatives. And then we get over the New Year's Day holiday, still no welfare check. And then we get into the uh, first of the new year where the daughter goes back to school and missed the first two weeks of school and no wel welfare check performed on the family. So right away it seemed odd. And keep in mind that this story came right on the heels of the Philip, Captain Philip Marshall family in Calaveras County, California, where they were found um, all dead of a single gunshot wound in the head. Um, in February of 2013, along with the family dog. Um, this story was all the same way, except the dog was living. The dog was there. The family dog was in the home. And when it was announced that body parts were missing from the human remains, they blamed it on the dog scavenging the bodies because he was so hungry. And what we've got is a variety of strange incidences of the uh, portions of the body that went missing. Um, and so what we've got is the official narrative of David Crowley uh, snapping, um, maybe having PTSD, P PTSD uh, being high on marijuana with some other stories, um, <laughs> mentally. Oh, geez. We had all, all of these theories came to, fact that, and to, to end up the fact that he shot his uh, daughter once in the head, his wife once, uh, twice in the head, and then himself once in the head. But after all this was done, Comel's body had two missing hands. Her left and right hands were missing. David's right hand, he was right-handed. His right hand was missing. Most of the skulls of David and Comel were missing. And the right, entire right arm of the daughter, Rania, the five-year-old daughter, her entire arm was missing, pulled out and uh, removed from the socket itself. And they said, well, the dog must have gotten so hungry the dog did all this. So after that, this has been four years now on the investigation in looking into the strange, bizarre case. And we've got 2,600 members on the justice page. There's another justice for David Crowley of Gray State that has 10,000 likes on that page. And there's a hashtag on Twitter called Justice for Crowley's. We're looking for justice for this family. Um, this was obviously a triple homicide. And why did they rule it a, a double homicide followed by a suicide at the hands of David Crowley um, when he was on record saying he was not suicidal and had plans looking forward to the future? So uh, going through the FOIA requests, uh, the group of us that have taken this case kind of by uh, – got a, got a stronghold on this case has started to file FOIA requests for the actual reports, the autopsies, the BCA testing – the test, uh, the um, alcohol, drugs in the body. There was no alcohol, no drugs in the body. And so various things like that, and we started to put together some YouTube broadcasts and had articles written about this story and had um, done radio interviews, much like this show here. So this is for over four years now with the strange things happening in the story, um, including, uh, oh, I almost forgot to mention David's mother, died seven months after the killings of the bodies were found, and she died under mysterious circumstances. His parents were divorced. She was living alone, and her body was found in the backyard patio at a table and chairs, uh, slumped over with uh, blood and vomit coming out of her mouth and nose. 
And so nothing was really answered to that. She, by, uh, by reading the police reports, the only member of the family, of both sides of the family, that questioned any of this was his mother, Kate. She said in the police reports that it didn't add up. There's no way that this would have happened unless they both had a, a pact or they did this together or they both agreed on it, him and a, you know, David and his wife. So she said, I don't believe this uh, happening unless there was a possible pact. So that introduced another theory that there was a possible pact theory. And then um, it was two years ago the documentary A Gray State came out that was directed by Eric Nelson um, out of California. And that was more of a propaganda piece uh, with a really heavy slant, uh, really pushed the angle that David uh, did this. It very much agreed with the official report. The uh, law enforcement report, by the way, the case is closed. The case is uh, finalized. They did rule that David did this. And that's where we stand today. The case is closed. Um, so we're just pushing along, trying to bring exposure and trying to raise awareness about this um, case that still hasn't been. We don't know if there, if it's a cover-up, if it's just uh, poor investigating, but there's uh, uh, many, many uh, inconsistencies. So far, the list is at 47 right now of just simple inconsistencies in this case. What really blows me away is that I didn't, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been involved in the, you know, the truth movement, 9-11 truth movement, uh, in the Fed, anti-Bilderberg, anti-globalist, anti-UN stuff for, I mean, years. And I've, I've been to New York. I've, you know, worked with InfoWars on certain things over the years. And I've never heard of this case, which, you know, it, I heard of it because of the Netflix thing. I saw Greg on, on my TV. It just looked like, you know, I saw the, tra- the trailer for it. And I'm like, whoa, what, what is this? And I, I, I popped it on. And then sure enough, I, I, I freaked out. I print screened it. I sent it to Greg. I'm like, why are you on Netflix? And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been working on this. Here's the link. So it, it's so amazing to me how. I mean, I've been researching all kinds of stuff and, and involved with the occult and stuff and false flag operations and, and things uh, of this nature, and this just totally flew off my radar. And, uh, I mean, the the documentary definitely is very slanted, and, um, and it's, I mean, it, it raises more questions than it answers, that's for sure. Here's a clip from the documentary, uh, and this is, a new a local news report with a police interview after the bodies were found. Apple Valley Police recently closed their exhaustive year-long investigation and for the first time are sharing their findings with the Fox 9 investigators. It looks like David uh, snapped and took the lives of his wife and daughter and then ultimately himself. Who wrote Allah Akbar on the wall? He did. In her blood? Yes. Why did he do that? We believe that was just kind of a parting shot. So that clip on its own is so unethical for them to speak in such absolutes about this thing that was at that time still being investigated. And, I mean, from your research, did they have any substantial evidence that for sure he wrote Al-Akbar on the wall with his wife's blood? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Nothing. And that, that clip was done, uh, I think, uh, a couple months after their investigation closed. Absolutely oh, not. Okay. And that's why they always say, we believe, we think, because they don't know shit. Right. I mean, within the time, the, you know, the, the time frame of, of the documentary, it seemed like, like that was released, right? So it, even there, I mean, they're just... They're playing with timelines and, and all of these things to kind of like sway the narrative in one way or another. And uh, so I, I saw that immediately as something that was very questionable in itself. Um, another thing shortly after that, they played this, and this raises a lot of questions to me as well. And this is a strange thing. It's almost like he created a soundtrack to the murder-suicide. You know, something called Ascent. This music probably played for hours, maybe days after they were dead. 
was he imagining these 53 songs as the songs that he would play while he's committing a murder-suicide? It's hard to know. I mean, this was on a loop. Who plans a soundtrack for the murder of their family? So uh, there's this playlist on his laptop uh, called Ascent. And, uh, of course, you know, it, it, when you think of the word ascent, you think of, you know, going up to heaven or, uh, you know, being risen up or something. Um, but it's very, uh, you know, odd, like, okay, so if he didn't do it, and, and again, like, I'm not making it, I, I don't know either way. This seems more like a staged homicide than a suicide for a lot of reasons that we can get into on the show. Um, but uh, do you guys think somebody, like, went onto his laptop and, and made this playlist? Um, I, I can take that, Greg. Uh, here, here's what we know when the when the after the bodies were discovered is that there was there was three notes, essentially three notes, um, none of which was an was a signed note or a letter from David saying he wanted to do this and signing his name uh, along with the reasons why. His laptop was opened. There was this 53 song loop playing called Ascent that David certainly could have had already. Uh, uh, made up before and have used, you know, potentially used in the past, but that was playing in a loop um, outward uh, out to the Bluetooth speaker. And after the, uh, the battery died in the speaker, it wasn't no longer playing, but they found the laptop uh, still playing with nothing coming out of it for that. Next to that, on the, on the laptop itself was a text box opened. Think of a program like WordPad or... Uh, or word, you know, WordPad, and it said really all it said on there. Uh, someone had typed in another alleged note that just says, "I have loved you all with all my heart." So someone had opened up the killers allegedly typed that up, and so police would think that that was a suicide note, um, something that anyone right. could have with access to that laptop. And then there was the blood writing on the wall, uh, written on the living room wall in capital letters. Allahu Akbar in blood. Now, this is something right out of a Charles Manson story here, but it was Comel's blood, the wife. Her blood, it was tested and found out that it was her blood that David allegedly wrote. Now, once again, no fingerprints, nothing tying him to writing that blood. Um, David typically writes in lowercase as far as a handwriting analysis. Never writes in all uppercase. This was all uppercase. In fact, it looked like a person, a left-handed person, wrote it, and David is right-handed. And then in the office, there's a notepad, a spiral notepad with a pen next to it that says, Submit to Allah now. Um, written in pen. Looks like David's handwriting. Looks like David actually wrote it. But um, the, those were the various notes that were left behind. So investigators came in and thought, wow, we have a gun lying here next to this man's left hand. He wrote all these messages, and obviously he must have killed everyone. And looking through the basement of the house, they see all of this uh, FEMA, uh, Homeland Security, gray state, anti-police, kind of radical extremist things. I think they would have looked at him without knowing who he was. Probably thought the guy was uh, nuts. There was some open marijuana on the bedroom dresser, um, conveniently left out, I think, as part of the staging to direct the investigators' minds that uh, someone was high when they did this, and they pinned it on him and shut the case um, and closed up the case. So all of these things were very, very strange, but I don't know if he, if someone created that playlist specifically for that or if that was already on his in his music box uh, on his Apple on his Mac, MacBook. But that was what was playing when investigators uh, came in. It was still playing in a loop. Yeah, for, I mean, what really was striking to me is that, of course, w they saved that for last uh, in the documentary because it's almost like the final nail in the coffin to anybody that's, that's watching this thing. To It was their attempt to be like, yes, of course, totally you did it because who would... Uh, who would know to go into his iTunes and look for a playlist or spend time making a playlist? It's just that's not, uh, not, not anything anyone would do. And in my opinion, unless 
it's someone who knew him and it's someone who, you know, worked on Grey State, perhaps even. I mean, someone who knew to look for something like this, to have it playing on his computer. And, you know, did they do this before the fact? Uh, and have them tied up or something, or did you know did they kill all of them and and then do this? Um, and now, as far as the uh, the missing body parts, um, I, I I flipped through a lot of the photos. It's kind of hard to tell. I don't know who took these photos, but they're terrible at their job because everything that I looked at that looked like a body part or looked like anything, it's like way off on the corner of the shot. And then, like ninety percent of ninety of the you know percent of the photos is just like carpet and things like that. I mean, uh, can you guys speak to the reason why the evidence is so terrible in this case? Go ahead, Greg. Oh, is, is I'm Greg sorry, there? Can you, yeah, I'm here. Can you can you you repeat that, please? Uh, yeah, I was just saying, I was looking through, like, these hundreds of photos on your website from the crime scene, and they are, uh, they're awful, like, in terms of quality, it seems like the person shooting these photos was, like, making it a point not to direct the camera at anything they were supposed to be looking at, it's all, like, weird, off on the side, slightly cut off pictures of things, like, what, what, what can you make of all that? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, well, we got, oh. um, we got 464 photos and then we got other photos later on, but, um, and there are four different cameras. So I, mm. I can, I can jump in there, Greg. Um, <laughs> Christian, as far as the, the comment, here's, here's what I think, cause I saw the same, uh, very much the same thing we have. We received all these photographs of the crime scene via a FOIA request and looking at them, they they look just just like a lot of just photos in every room, upstairs, downstairs, each of the rooms, and also the main crime scene, which is the living room. And then when someone got a hold of the audio, the police audio of the police responding to the scene, the first thing that they captured uh, their mind was when they went around back, the officer said the rear slider patio door is unlocked and slightly ajar. And that was never mentioned in the police uh, reports until someone grabbed that audio. And so one thing I did notice in looking at the in the detective photographs is that there was 15 photos of the front door, all from different angles, showing there was no break-in. Uh, front, the, the back, the side angle, the door opened. It, it, it showed all these evidence that there was no forced entry into the home. And I, I know they have to take those, you know, Photos, but we we already know that the access to the home was was open because of the rear slider that was unlocked and slightly left open a quarter of an inch, and this is January in Minnesota, and that rear slider was was open uh, with a dog running around in the house for for three weeks. So, the photographs themselves uh, themselves is it, we've been able to delve into them a little bit with the detail by zooming in on some of these things and. And that's where we saw, you know, a, a lot of things that just didn't didn't make sense. There was a knife uh, at the scene, you know, a, a knife. And then the weapon wasn't photographed where it was, you know, uh, at, at the scene. It was photographed sitting on a table with the magazine out and the bullets uh, ejected and the, you know, various shots of the pistol just lying there. Now, it was it was his gun. David did own this forty caliber handgun, um, and it was registered to him. But uh, uh, no fingerprints of all of, of no he didn't have any fingerprints on his own weapon that was found. Huh. So things that yeah, we started. Of course he would. You know, I mean, if 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 it's your, I mean, if you put if if you take fingerprints from any of my guns, of course my fingerprints are going to be all over them. Granted, uh, all of the photos that and videos that we saw in the documentary that he was, like, shooting, kind of prepping. He took a lot of uh, footage of himself, and typically when he was holding firearms, he was usually wearing those, like, Oakley combat gloves. But nevertheless, I'm sure he takes the things to the range from time to time, and I doubt he cleans it with bleach after every, you know, every time he uses the thing. Yeah, so that that's all very interesting because he would he's very much into his guns and his weapons and like Greg said he was in the US military served uh, a couple stints one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan 
and did a lot of shooting and training and was very much a producer and an art, very artsy and creative in his film um, uh, his film background. Film was his life, so he was he he made it very obvious that he recorded stuff all all during the day, whether it was his daughter, whether it was a family vacation, whether them just sitting around having uh, having dinner or eating ice cream. David had his camera out filming and looking for that shot and looking for that. That's just the way his mind um, operated. So they did show a lot of those clips in that documentary. Yeah, I found that, I mean, it just very convenient and unusual. I mean, not like saying anything's wrong with what he was doing, but, I mean, you know, you see – footage of like a GoPro of him at the gym, like working out and this and that. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, kind of being a new documentary filmmaker myself, I was like, man, like how great is it to do a documentary about a subject that is just constantly filming themselves that you can have all this B-roll to work with and you don't have to deal with like hiring drone operators to get all these, you know, just kind of fill shots that is about... 60% 60% of most documentaries these days, they didn't need any of that. He had so much. So yeah. uh, it was very interesting. Um, I, I want to talk about a little bit, um, one of the, the things that they that the, uh, a gray state really uses to try to question the, uh, the motives and the morality and the, the, the headspace um, of, of, you know, the victim is uh, they, they're using these audio clips and almost like he had these like note to self um, situations where he was talking about how he was going to approach uh, people trying to fund the film. And it was this very kind of like Hollywood schmoozy, uh, very manipulative sounding kind of narrative that he was, he was using uh, it, it, almost as if he would be like recording himself talking, pitching the idea, just uh, you know, giving this persona, just so he could then listen back and critique his pitch and things like that. And then when they played that for, I think someone, uh, a film company that was going to take on Gray State, they were just like, "That's disgusting," because he even talks about how like um, people in the the Liberty Movement. You know, uh, Alex Jones, InfoWars people, they're a bunch of schmucks. You know, we're going to take their money and this and that. It was pretty messed up. I mean, I'm not going to lie. When I heard that, I'm like, ah, oh, damn, like, this, this is, this is going to be hard for me. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm really curious to know uh, how you hear that. Do you have any, any, any notes on any of that? Well, I think with the – Greg, was it 13 terabytes of data? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, twelve or twelve or thirteen. So, so police mm-hmm. went through and 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 part of the investigation, they collected all these hard drives and and camera equipment and laptops and computers and phones. And so, when they added it all up, there was thirteen, roughly twelve to thirteen terabytes of data to go through. <clears throat> and so, they assigned a special task force. This uh, in Apple outside Apple, Apple Valley, there's a Dakota County Crimes Electronic Crimes Task Force. So they assigned this to them just to go through all of this data of the recordings, the audio, and the video. And what I think is the reason part of this this uh, propaganda-based documentary was put was shoved out there to get into the mainstream is to uh, really paint this, this evil picture of this uh, nutcase, David Crowley. And what they did, it's my opinion that they cherry-picked all of this, all of, of all the videos to pick, the ones used in the in the movie itself, all depicted David in kind of a crazy, um, not too bright, not well, not not a. It didn't sh- p- point him in a good light. Let's put it that way. Uh, everything yeah. that he, the clips that were used were all very questionable, and they could have had hours and hours of him being a good dad, a good father, a good husband, um, and uh, and working with his staff and his team on this project, but they took. You know, various like a temper tantrum of the daughter in the basement. They used that, uh, and, right. and they talked. They it was all taken out of context, and so they put in these uh, really the, the clips they included were the very bizarre ones, like him talking to himself to try to pitch to these producers um, what to do and how he could possibly get it uh, get it done and get it funded. 
and then talking to how to what are good ways to get funding. Um, Liberty Movement, it's a good way to get people to open up their wallets, I think he mentioned. And all those, I think, were, were him were him saying those things. Those were true uh, comments. But the fact, the bigger picture is, why did the film documentary crew elect to use those that footage in particular? That's That's the question. Absolutely. And I can probably answer it with like fair certainty when you look at who they chose to interview i mean other than you guys which i think it's also really interesting that you guys have the most to say about this compared to anyone else in the documentary yet they show you for like three not even like 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 30 seconds in the beginning of the movie and then about another 30 seconds around the end of the movie when this documentary could have been essentially what a gray stage, uh, Greg Fernandez's ongoing video series, which um, I'm sure most of you have not seen yet. You need to go to YouTube, check out uh, Greg Fernandez Jr.'s uh, gray stage. He has a whole playlist, and I'm about 3% into it, and it's riveting stuff. It's like you know, breaking down all the photos. Uh, the BCA data request files, uh, you know, it's just hundreds of pages of stuff that I've just been just flipping through very frantically to prepare for this show. And uh, you guys have so much more information on what actually happened than this documentary uh, wants it to portray. Then they have, I don't even know, um, that one guy that was uh, watching the, the video of the daughter talking about the room being full of blood and then he was like you want to know what i really think uh you know and, and it, who is that guy he's just like some kind of liberal like doesn't understand he has nothing to do with any of this as far as i saw and i think that's where this film was good you say it's a california-based company california i mean a lot of these people over there uh they're they're, they're in on it they're globalists they, they want a new world order. They think pedophilia is okay. And, I mean, they are the enemy, you could say. Most of uh, California that is being in doctor, you have Hollywood, uh, pedo wood going on out there and stuff. And so I, I, I think you have this kind of lefty, straight out of film school, trying to prove something that these uh, – these people that are against globalism, against the police state, against uh, everything that, in our opinion, as libertarians and independents, real Americans uh, believe that you know we should be against. You know, they think that we're the enemy. They think that we're a bunch of gun-toting crazies and that we're just going to go unhinged and so when they saw the official report they were like oh of course that's what happened and they they then took that narrative and just tried to make that work yes i agree yeah. i agree absolutely and they're always using this stuff they're always using this for like gun rights to take away people's people's guns they're not interested in taking away everybody's guns because they still want their guns, but they're, they don't want us to have guns at, at that point. And I think there was even some stats, Dan. Wasn't there some stats that in, included this um, in gun, gun violence? I call this a case of gun violence and some other crazy stuff, or am I just imagining that? Yeah, they, uh, you got to think of the, uh, the quote that says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And so yeah. when they heard a case, they were able to – I think, put this documentary together to serve two purposes. One would be to cement the official narrative that the Apple Valley Police Department gave, saying that David did this. And number two was to put together a documentary like this to discredit all conspiracy theorists as a whole and consider them all um, wacky, loony, crazy types of folks. And so that, to me, if this was done that way on purpose, with that much of a propaganda slant to it, it was more than likely funded uh, as a uh, Operation Mockingbird CIA-funded project uh, to do this on purpose with the propaganda slant, um, and so that that leads me to believe that this was done. This was a uh, this was a, an operation to get this uh, project out there and make it go 
and try to get it to go mainstream, um, to discredit um, this entire crowd and to discredit David. I wonder Absolutely. if that's why everybody went went silent, right? I never understood that, why all these people just kind of went, went silent. And, I mean, you have David Crowley talking about how he doesn't want to be like all of these other people. He He's talking about, you know, giving his film – He's doing it for free, right? And it's, I don't know. To me, it's just, it's, it just it does, does not seem like a guy who is about to snap, as that clip said. And that clip really bothers me for many reasons. Um, but <laughs> there's no way. I mean, how do they know? How do the cops know that David wrote, uh, wrote in Kamel's blood? How do they know that David actually wrote that? You know, things like, like that, that we're just supposed to just take it at face value and keep on going. You know, there's nothing to see here. And, and I'm just, I'm tired of it. And I'm tired of it in the alternative sector. That's where the disappointment really has hit me hard because, man, I thought, you know, I thought, uh, I thought this was a slam dunk case for anybody who wanted to cover it, for anybody who, who could make a good film. And that's what I was hoping that this film was was going to do. I was hoping it was going to give us some closure, some answers, and it and it didn't do that. And so, yeah, of course, it seems like it wasn't meant to ever to ever do that. But you know what? It's it's created more people looking at this case. So that <laughs> the documentary continues to help us. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Greg. Um, it, the way it was pitched to us, uh, Christian. It was pitched to Greg and I the fact that uh, they were watching our uh, YouTube videos and some of our discussion videos about this case, and we got approached by saying we'd like to do we're going to do a documentary on this case and we'd like to put everything to bed, put everything solve this case, and then we want to get you guys involved because you two are the two following this case outside of the law enforcement community, and uh, we think we can make this go uh, big budget. they premiered this at the Tribeca Film Festival. And so they, they said, we're going to come in with the film crew and interview you guys and then also go to the crime scene in Apple Valley, Minnesota and interview family, friends, and really try to get to the guts of what really happened here because uh, the way I was, was presented to me that they, the film crew um, also knew it was a cover-up or it was a staged scene. So I signed up. I said, sounds good. Uh, let's, let's get this thing done. Greg was a little more apprehensive by saying, I don't know what what their ulterior motive uh, was. I twisted his arm a little bit, and then he signed up. We did it, and they came and interviewed uh, him for two hours at his place, me for two hours at my place. And then when the video was done, um, we got basically used. Uh, They they showed 30 seconds of clips between us, cherry-picking only the clips that made us look bad (laughs) and look nuts. And then they used, they heavily used the footage that made David look bad, and then the rest of the family and friends that were interviewed uh, agreeing with the official narrative. And so we got uh, essentially used um, on this uh, project. So, so I think Greg was right at the beginning that they were not out to get the truth out there, and a documentary does need to be made on this case the right way. I completely agree, and yeah. I would like to do it. I mean, uh, you I should do what, it. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, well, uh, yeah, it. the three. Was, I think that this is our first meeting of our new documentary, essentially, because um, what you said, Greg, is exactly right. I've been disappointed by quote unquote activists, quote unquote the the truth community. Where are they? I've been doing this. Uh, we started uh, federaljack.com back in 05, and then we had something about a thousand people helping out. We were a student organization, and then after that, I got injured. I moved up here to Central Florida. I tried to start stuff up here, and psh, no one cares about anything in or- in the Orlando area. There's like five or six of us, and like you know, we're a tight knit group. And, uh, and and that's it. And essentially, it's Sacred Elves. It's our punk band. And most of these, uh, you know, young people that are in the music scene, that, like, they're social justice warriors and they care about this and that, it's like when you try to talk to them about 
things that are really important that affect all of us, like civil liberties, police state, false flag operations, things like that. They're like, oh, yeah, conspiracy theories. Like, they're so indoctrinated. And this is the counterculture. These aren't normies. These aren't people that have like nine to five jobs and wear suits and stuff. These aren't, these aren't, this is the counterculture. And then anybody that is any sort of activist and stuff, they're all like communist, leftist leaning, socialist. They think AOC is, is the ne- you know the next. Uh, they want AOC and Bernie to run the country, you know. And then meanwhile, it's like no, like what about like uh, Candace Owens or something? Like she, I want her to run. She, that'd be fantastic. But you know, it, it, and, and anyone that supports libertarian ideas, anyone that supports stuff like that, you know, like they say things to me like, oh, your alt right is showing, and it's like alt right. I'm I'm a libertarian. I'm in the middle. I th- I'm against the left-right paradigm, and this is the same kind of stuff that Alex Jones has been talking about for a long time. That you know, where is this activist truth movement? I I I'm calling all of you out. If you're listening to this, you're a little bit woke for finding us and actually taking the time to listen. Thank you, but we need your support, and it's more than just like donating, which nobody does. And it'd be fantastic if we even got like a dollar to five dollars here or there. That'd be great. You know, now we'll get like one person every couple months that will drop like, you know, a hundred bucks and man, that keeps us going, <laughs> you know, barely we, sk- we, we skate by. But uh, more than that, like, where is your act? I want you to show up to, to a, a protest. I want you to show when we have an event, drive out, show up. And, you know, th- there's nothing really going on. And, and I'm so it's just year after year I get older and I, I'm still fighting for the same cause and it just gets very disappointing where, you know, you'll see people that might get interested and they'll disappear after a couple of years. And you have to wonder like, did they get to them or did they just like in the matrix decide that they would rather go back to sleep? They want to bite into that steak. They know it's not real, but it tastes good. So they're just going to, you know, tune out and, and join the mainstream and I get that a lot of this stuff is triggering, and I honestly think that, you know, it might have even been possible that the creators of a gray state had the best of intentions, but as they started really getting into the nitty-gritty, once you start looking at those crime scene photos, once you start really, like, I'm sure they got haunted by the whole thing, and if you're not strong enough, you're just going to be like, yeah, I'm just going to go with the official narrative because I just want this thing to be over with. And and I think that the, if they weren't and from the fine. get-go, yeah, exactly. If 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 you yeah. don't have it in you, but, but your, don't your mental health us. is more important, right? Yeah, but 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 don't come after us. Don't stand in our way for people who do want to find out what the truth is. Don't do that. You know what I mean? Right, and that's exactly what mm-hmm. they do. Where anytime you bring up stuff like this, or you know, you even have questions about like vaccinations or you have questions, you know, you, you share a, a, a report about something that is like, oh, man, this this doesn't look good. They're just like, oh, here we go. Tinfoil hat and you know, all the memes, ah. you know, and it's it, it it's like they are ashamed in themselves uh, that they don't have the strength. They don't have the courage stand up for something and even though uh you know people might laugh at you people might uh discredit you call you the devil call you all kinds of, i get called all kinds of things man and it's just like you're, you're just mad at me because you wish that you could do this you wish that you had the courage to to be like yeah i'm gonna go against the grain on this one guys and i'm i'm ready to you know go out swinging uh, because all of you guys, like crabs in a barrel, are trying to bring me down when I've been doing nothing but all of your things and stuff. Whether I might, you know, agree or you know, or you know, a hundred percent or whatever, I, I'm supportive. I'm like, yeah, you're you're trying to put something back into the world. That's cool, you know. And and you have my support. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you have just a lot of people that are just trying to tear you down. But uh, I, you know, darkdocs.com. Uh, we're working on uh, uh, several documentaries right now, and we'd like to take this one on too. Uh, right now we're working on a documentary called Exposing Pedo Swim. I've been researching uh, Adult Swim, and in particular Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, 
the uh, co-creators of Rick and Morty. And these guys have been making hardcore, sadistic, murder, pedophile cartoons that are available on their Vimeo channel right now. We've backed up their whole archive because there's some criminal stuff in there. They even use, like, the PBS Kids logo uh, repetitiously at the beginning and end of episodes to kind of make the joke uh, for, like, two girls in one cup that has, like, like hardcore, like, gory scenes. The whole show is about a cup living with two girls that are trying to get them to piss and shit inside of it and all kinds of other nasty things. But they're slapping the PBS Kids logo on there. And uh, they're talking about on their Twitter about how uh, in, in an alternate reality, Rick and Morty have a, a very happy, healthy, consensual, sexual relationship. And that's after they made the Doc and Marty cartoon, the, the precursor of the Rick and Morty. That is entirely about blowjobs being given from Rick to, or Morty to Doc in order for the time travel car to work. It's disgusting, and it's part of an agenda to, you know, show this stuff to kids and act like, oh, it's funny, what's the big deal? You know, so we're working on that, uh, and uh, we put out, of course, uh, Sacred Out There here to save the world, which is our band's tour documentary uh, going from Florida to the Bohemian Grove last summer, and we made a conspiracy road trip out of it. We stopped by the Denver airport, and we filmed all of those uh, really creepy globalist murder uh, a bunch of children in caskets, uh, murals that they have out there, and then how the Denver airport put out a whole thing about conspiracy theorists and you know trying to discredit anyone talking about it. We went to Boys Town, Nebraska, and showed what it looks like today, and went into the museum, all kinds of weird stuff going on in there. Um, but we love it, and it's all very low budget, and we're totally happy with that. Most of it was shot with uh, – $12 spy glasses from the Wish app and our cell phones, and, and that's it. Uh, and that way, we don't have to go out and crowdsource. We don't need GoFundMe. We don't need thousands of dollars. We That documentary cost us whatever it costs to put gas into our vehicles and, you know, maybe 10, 20 bucks and a couple of, like, toys that we use to record things with. Uh, we're using a hacked version of Sony Vegas Pro I've had for over a decade. And we released the, the DVDs ourselves. It's not on any, you know, it's like, and, and that's the only way you're going to get a true product. And the more people donate to darkdocs.com and eternal affairs media, uh, the quality is going to go up because we're going to take that money and we're going to buy nicer cameras and nicer things and be able to go out and do new things. So again, if you see value in these kinds of things, Please uh, donate. Um, but, man, like, we would like to uh, – I, I love the title uh, you came up with, Greg, uh, The Gray Stage, because when you look at these crime scene photos, it's so staged. Everything is, like, put in, in the right place, and, uh, and it, it, it looks like um, uh, that Crowley, that David Crowley, put all this stuff together. Like, it's staged to look like the perfect – uh, you know, murder suicide. But if I was doing a murder suicide, you know, or anybody that I would imagine, it's you, you're not in like a very OCD. You know, everything has to be perfect. And and I think that's another reason why in a gray state uh, they kept railing on, oh, he's a perfectionist. If if he had any flaws, he was a control freak. Everything had to be his way. They were trying to put that into your head almost in like a very subliminal way, the whole film, in order for you to, yeah. you know, once you see the end of the film, be like, oh, of course. Well, you know, it, it's so spoon-fed to you. And that is so, so suspect to me that it was staged by somebody else that knew him very well. And I want to get a little bit into that. Uh, I, I came across right before we got on the air, um, on your site, Greg, the uh, the – some of the last posts that were on, on Facebook from David uh, where he was saying uh, that, you know, the film, the film's going to come out and you guys are, are, are freaking sweep. I hope the film makes you all proud. Uh, I would, I would try to do a private screening or something exclusive, but hearing the news every day, I don't think we have the time. 
And then uh, that was really that's, that's for that's for his for the 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 documentary David was working on. Right, it was like a documentary about the making of the film, right? Correct. Right, right. And then uh, one one of the comments uh, underneath that was, "You need to call me. I'm all good with getting out free intact. Getting out free intact. I brought up." That initially is kind of weird phrasing there, uh, but it's really. I think he meant in fact, but yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but if it's released before my court, you may send me to prison instead of beating my case. For real, though, David Crowley, call me. And then he responded, I don't have any of your tax talk in there, Sean, my man. Don't sweat it. This movie is meant to send other people to prison. So, I mean, that right there, you have this guy that I guess was talking about some weird tax thing. Um, I saw you spoke about that a little bit. You, would you like to elaborate on your thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, that's, that's from Sean Wright, who, who is also in that film, who had a big hand in that film, was behind the scenes involved in that project. So... Um, he was worried that David Crowley was going to put his tax stuff into the film. And of course, David didn't do that. But Sean still has to pay some fines for, for taxes. So he still found out the hard way that uh, you got to pay your taxes. Now that, that was weird because that was on December 9, 2014. And this is when, uh, you know, this is, this is, I mean, they, they say David Crowley probably killed – they say everybody was probably dead by by December 26th. Okay, this is December 9th. Sean Wright claims to be very close with, with David. If he's so close with David, why doesn't he – why doesn't – why is Sean Wright writing his own phone number on this post, on this public Facebook post? Sean Wright is actually writing it there. Oh, yeah. So you can trace all of this film goes back to the same cast of characters, the same people that are trying to tell us there's nothing here. Don't worry about it. Don't look at it because you don't want Department of Homeland Security or the FBI looking down on you. It's all threats, and it's all veiled threats. But this just really shows that a lot of the stuff that Sean Wright said is not true. And, and he's not the only one. He's a very, very small very, very small um, actor in this whole stage, right, in this whole thing. Whether you think the crime scene was staged by David Crowley or staged by somebody else, to me, this is a staged scene. The only question is who staged it. And if it's not David Crowley, then it obviously has to be somebody else. Um, so the whole Sean Wright thing, uh, and this, this post was very, very strange because this was a post that was actually taken down after David Crowley died. Well, who had access to this? And why was this post taken down, period? Did, did David right. take it so, down? Yeah, so someone got onto David's computer, maybe after the, 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 after the murder, going through to, to scrape anything that would well, point to them. You wouldn't need to get on his computer, right? You would just need to know his username and password. Yeah, but if you didn't know his username and password, the only way would be if it, you went onto his laptop and it was already logged in, which most of us stay logged into Facebook. I mean, so you don't have to log in every single time. I'm a little more paranoid. I log in and out like all the time and change my passwords because you know, <laughs> like okay. I know better. Yeah. <laughs> but remember, David's password was in the hands of the authorities um, as evidence at that point. So someone logged in under David Crowley's personal Facebook wall, and there was a handful of posts deleted from his own wall. And the question is, the question is why, and the question is who, who did that? Well, I like uh, I like where you're going, and I, I'm I'm almost picturing, um, you know, if we we're going to put out this gray stage. Uh, documentary calling it the gray stage 
Um, I'm almost. I, I love like the the graphic you use, Greg. It's just like this very you know old fashioned looking, uh, almost Shakespearean stage. Um, and now we're talking about the actors on the stage. Now we have uh, this this Sean person. Let's talk about some other. I, I like to name names because when people are like, oh, who is involved? Who's guilty? Who is they? Uh, I'd like to know some names. So you, you want to go drop some names and, and how they're involved and how they might be suspects in this murder? Because that's, that's exactly what I'd like to do with this documentary. Greg, did we lose you? Oh, I, um, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I would say the, the one name is uh, the, the first thing we have to remember on a case like this is that the, the, there was two sides of who thought did this. If David didn't do it, <clears throat> everyone else thought that the, the, the government did. Some some black operation came in. Some wet work team came in. It was a professional hit. They wanted him out because of his movie. And that's not right. what uh, Greg or I have ever said at all. Now, they uh, they used that to, to, to call us conspiracy theorists because uh, some dark entity came in and did this. Um, <clears throat> after we started getting accused of some of those things, we said our focus needs to be on the evidence and the evidence only and let the evidence talk because too many people have their theories and what they think happened. So we we started, Greg and I and um, the uh, the other members on the on the justice page have started going through all the, 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 uh, the details in, in fine print of all the evidence. And so what it leads, <clears throat> the, what, what, in my in my mind specifically, I don't think it was the government who did it, or a uh, a wet work operation or a professional hit because this was number one it was too sloppily done, and number two it was overstaged. The scene was overstaged, and the people that David was having his problems with uh, toward the end of his life was the people in his very inner circle with the project. Now, the when the crime came out, the the the, the narrative that was pushed, that was heavily pushed, was that David was, was despondent about not getting this contract. David was down in the dumps about not getting his uh, movie deal done from Hollywood. And so when we stripped out the fact and went right to the source, and I did an interview with the president of MEG Productions, uh, the Michael Entertainment Group, that was the group that that signed David on to a, an agreement to turn his script into a movie series or a TV series. So he did, in fact, have a contract in place. Um, and so it, we really started to question those who were pushing the narrative that he was down in the dumps about not getting this deal or not getting the funding to go big because this was his lifelong project. So he started looking internally at the members of his own team. And his co-star or the leading actor was uh, by the name of Danny August Mason, um, was going to be the lead actor in this play, in this uh, in this movie or the script. Now, David and Danny created, co-created this project called the Gray State, and um, uh, both were heavily in influenced. When he got this deal, when David was working with his lawyer team, they had him uh, send out uh, release uh, rights release uh, legal documentation to release others' rights from it. So, so David would have 100% ownership of the script and the rights of this movie uh, deal, of this script, for instance. And so he sent it to one of his uh, partners, and that other, that person uh, signed it off and was free to go. Danny August Mason didn't do it and never did do it, <clears throat> never, ever signed it. And, in fact, went back and forth with David on an email exchange that we later acquired, um, trying to work a deal where he would get something in return um, out of it, because he says I'm not going to sign, I'm not going to give up my rights if you're working on this 30 million dollar deal, and I put all my uh, blood, sweat, and tears into this. You're not going to just cut me loose. So there was some friction there leading up to the murders, and so one was this individual, Danny August Mason, that has been very, <clears throat> very odd uh, in his behavior in the aftermath of this murder. Um, one of the things with him, and I'm not calling out any suspects, I'm just calling out people that are persons of interest, I would I would consider if I was a detective, uh, he would be one of your first people you'd want to contact. When they interviewed Danny August Mason, he said he was only an actor in the film and didn't have a business um, 
he, he wasn't involved from a business perspective and didn't have an ownership of the project. So they, the cops interviewed him, and off, off he went on, they, on to the next person. Um, but if they would have known that he did have a business interest, he was vested in the success of this company, and he had the greatest amount to lose um, if the project went dead or if, Dave, if he signed off his rights. Uh, there's your motive. There's your motive right there. And so they went back and forth uh, on this email exchange, and um, they, they both dug their heels in, and next thing you know, uh, David Crowley is dead, which raises the question as to why the entire family um, um, had to be killed. If someone didn't like David or didn't like his work or was out to get him, he could have been dispatched of and disposed of very easily. Um, easily would have been, uh, you could have easily killed him. But the question remains on a case like this is why was he, David, and all of his remaining heirs killed? on a $30 million asset that someone had. Well, that's gonna, the script now is going to fall into the hands of his family. And David uh, Crowley's brother, older brother, Danny Crowley Jr., was very good friends with this, all these other cast of characters. And, um, this, and sure enough, the script fell into the lap, and that's, that's how they got into the family. Uh, they were going to take it and run with it. And, um, in fact, five months after the killings, Danny August Mason went to the uh, Secretary of State of Minnesota uh, and created a brand new business called Gray State Universe LLC and was taking that script to go to uh, pitch it to Hollywood uh, movies. And this was five months after grieving. Actually, it was May, Greg, I believe. So uh, four months after the bodies are found, Danny August Mason is spending his time along with uh, David Crowley's uh, older brother to set up a company to pitch this project to make some big bucks off it. And so that's why I think, and that's just my personal opinion, is why you didn't have to take out David. You, and all, the only way to this, for this to work is to take out all three members of the remaining heirs of the family, and it's going to land back in the family's, um, back in their lap to do whatever they want with. And Danny Crowley, the older brother, um, was not talking to David Crowley since August of the last year of that last year of his life. They got into some rift about something and then we're no longer speaking and I think um, when it got toward the end I think David Crowley started realizing that there were snakes in his inner circle and he uh, he uh, started pulling away and started uh, isolating himself now they mentioned the isolation in the movie but they used that to say that he was despondent and was uh, you know bordering on killing himself so there you're putting that shift in once again but uh, but he was not despondent and um, and and someone, whoever one of them, they needed all those, uh, all three of them, dead. So that script, if, if David was killed, would not fall to Comel, the wife. And if uh, the, both of them were killed, it's going to fall to their daughter. So there's your reason, I believe, that you needed all three of these people dead. So the most valuable asset that these, this this young family had was that script. That was the most valuable asset they had. They didn't live in a big house and drive big cars. Um, they were a young couple, young married couple, but once word got out, you're sitting on a $30 million script potentially, uh, and you're going to write off the main character and the co-creator of the project and get him out from legal, by legal means, get him out. Now, that's not going to sit well, and is that going to lead someone to, to murder? I don't know. Uh, people have murdered for less. It's just yeah, so... And, and I, I, Damn petty. I was just like to <laughs> I mean, add that, well, I mean, and this this doesn't mean that Dan is saying that that's what happened. We're not saying that that's oh, it. Oh, of course but, not. You know, we're speculating um, here. But that's, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is, you know, he's he's good at just laying all of these different things out, and then people kind of take certain things and they kind of twist it or they just clip it. You know what I mean? They just use certain quotes. They And that's what the whole documentary is. To me, it, it, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Except for maybe our parts, you know, um, it, it everything just seemed very, very twisted and just taken out of out of context. So I think um, knowing knowing that, I wanted to make sure going into this thing because Dan had to do more than twist my arm; he almost had to put me in a chokehold, from what I remember. But um, <laughs> when I got when I when I did want to get involved with this, um, you know, I just figured, well, you know what, we're just going to be honest. We're going to be truthful, 
We're going to tell them exactly what we've been researching. We're going to give them all of the data and hope that they do something with it. We're going to tell them that the police left that house without two very important bullets. We're going to tell them that they left that house without looking up and seeing a bullet hole in the living room ceiling. How is that possible? And they would not put that in there. Those would have been the smoking guns that would have sunk the whole movie, would have sunk the whole thing. And they just, they, they can never, ever take that back. So. Sorry. Yep. Oh, man. It's, I mean, it, it's, I'm just flipping through the photos here of the family and stuff. Uh, on the, I, I just linked uh, the Justice for David Crowley um, page as well as the Justice for David Crowley and family uh, group uh, on this. And uh, anyone listening, like definitely, uh, you know, add, jo- join the group, like the page, and uh, you know, because it, this is just an ongoing, just awful wormhole of of just really, you know, loose ends. It's all just loose ends. I mean, this is probably one of the most messy cases that I've seen. I mean, where I, you you almost get overwhelmed and you don't know where to start. <laughs> I mean, with, with all of this, uh, we definitely have our work cut out for us. And you've definitely done a lot of work, you know, moving forward to, you know, to, to get started with us for sure. Um, and this is all Dan, Dan's Dan's fault, by the way. Dan started all of this. All his <laughs> yeah, he got he got you into this. Yep, he he got me into this. I did not want to look into this. I was not a fan of David Crowley. I didn't really want anything to do with this, but he asked me to, and I looked into it, and that was that was pretty much it. But I always like to blame him. It just makes me feel better. Oh, oh thank yeah. you, thank. You. <laughs> Greg, the good, a good point you just brought up about the uh, the bullets and the uh, detectives not tying out the number of uh, casings, bullet casings from this 40 caliber to the number of bullet fragments that they left the house with on the day that they wrapped up the crime scene. The, uh, the house is roped off for one day, and then they open it basically back up after the cleaners came in. But the day that they left, they found that six rounds were fired, and they had left with one, two, three, four... Uh, bullet fragments on this, and the hollow points were used. For some reason, you want to kill yourself. I don't know why you'd use hollow point 40 caliber, um, but that must have been to what David's plans was when he killed himself to use a hollow point. So they left with four bullets. Um, they thought, police thought they had one bullet from David, one from Rania, one from Kamel, and one they found lodged in the base basement wall that had been shot from the upstairs directly into the floor uh, and landed in the basement wall. They dug that out, and they left with four bullet fragments. Now, they also had six casings laying on the floor. So they didn't do the math. They, uh, they left, and they basically they treated the, this as a double homicide followed by a murder. Now, the cleaning crew comes in, and they're lifting up the rug in the, in the living room and pulled the rug back, and, and a bullet fragment fell out from beneath the rug. They didn't want to touch it. They call the police. They show up and says, yep, this is another. This is bullet fragment number five. There's still still one short, but they found bullet fragment five uh, two days later. And so when they get all these things tested, they they find out that the, the mushroomed bullets, three of them had Comel's uh, blood, DNA, tissue, and hair. Inside that mushroomed bullet, Comel, uh, suggesting, I'm not saying, but suggesting she was shot three times. One of the bullet fragments had Comel, uh, Rania, the daughter, the five-year-old. Rania's uh, blood, hair, and tissue in that, that went, that bullet uh, uh, fragment, that mushroom bullet that went through her skull was attributable to her. And then one in the basement that didn't have any uh, human tissue on it that was fired into the wall which, once again, if you're uh, shooting your family, um, why would you need some kind of a warning shot or, or a shot into the, in, in, just into the floor while standing there? So that, that seemed odd. And also, if you're part of a pact, have a pact with your wife to kill her, uh, I don't see why you'd need to have a shoot her three times. Uh, but they left there without having a single bullet of David's. 
No David, the, the kill shot of David Crowley himself wasn't found. They come back for a third time. This is late February of 2015 after someone in the police report says uh, we were inspecting a hole in the ceiling. And uh, we can't believe that you guys missed a hole in the ceiling. They went up into the attic and found a bullet, a fragment of a mushroomed 40 caliber bullet. Went to the lab, didn't find David's blood, tissue, or hair on it. Not a speck of blood. Did find uh, David Crowley's touch DNA on that bullet fragment. So they said, well, this must be his. Case closed. Now, we've had people look into that and saying that if you're shot in the skull with a hollow point, it's going to mushroom out and grab uh, brain matter, tissue, blood, hair, skin, and all inside of that small microscopic uh, bullet fragment, you're going to have all those things. There's no way a bullet that went through someone's skull is not going to have anything on it. It's going to be clean, except touch DNA. Now, David had plenty of rounds of ammunition and plenty of guns in the house. Uh, he probably had his touch DNA on all those um, live round bullets uh, at, at one point. But uh, the Apple Valley Police Department closed the case with never having the fingerprints on the weapon of David Crowley, a gun laying by his left hand, no bullet fragment of anything that went through his head at all, if he was even shot, and closed it up just like that. Um, so there's lots of strange uh, things here. Now, the city of Apple Valley is, is about 46,000 in population, kind of a small to mid-sized uh, city here in Minnesota. Uh, but they average one homicide per year, one. So they get a triple homicide, and it's not out of the question. I think it's fair to say that they were over their head on a case like this. And so even yeah. if they were investigating this thing honestly, um, they uh, they just assumed that, that he did it, uh, and maybe there wasn't a cover-up. But who knows? Uh, there's no way this would have been done this sloppily. And then once they got caught uh, with so many inconsistencies here, uh, we feel, uh, Greg and I both feel, that they, they pretty much dug their heels in and says, well, we're not going to admit our mistakes now. The case is closed. We're not going to look into it. And since then, we've been sending the uh, the uh, law enforcement authority and the captain and the police captain and the chief, uh, several more uh, forms of evidence that has come to light recently, including phone records, uh, text messages, and, and the like. Um, that packet of information has also been sent to, to the Minnesota Attorney General. And no one, and I repeat, no one is interested in looking at this case. Yeah, I mean, because I, I could totally see to them, they're just like, eh, crazy conspiracy nut, you know, all this Ron Paul, bunch of FEMA stuff, guns everywhere. He went crazy, killed his family, case closed, we got stuff to do, you know, I'm not going to, you know, be opening up cold, uh, cold cases, and, you know, and, and I mean, to be fair, uh, that a lot of, uh, you know, closed cases, uh, cold cases, um, you know, not even as absurd as this one you know people uh you know, they never want to let go so i'm sure they get bombarded with all kinds of stuff so it just becomes all white noise to them you know it's like not even necessarily like some kind of like you said some kind of cover-up or conspiracy but i could definitely see them being like look we we just don't have the time or resources for this or forget it and, and that, that's the unfortunate thing about law enforcement and why you know i respect people in law enforcement that decided to do this very thankless job that, you know, doesn't pay very well and it's, it's gritty and it's horrible. And I considered going into it myself. Um, but, uh, at the same time, it, it really comes down to, uh, it, it comes down to citizens doing the due diligence. I mean, you guys are really doing law enforcement's work for them, you know, and you guys don't get paid a cent for it. It's, you're doing it really out of, uh, just, the grace of your hearts and stuff and i really appreciate it and it's it's really nice to meet people like you that you know it makes me feel like i'm not alone when i'm up at 4 a.m and you know I, I need a shower and i'm just like pouring over these documents and sometimes i just stop and laugh to myself and i'm like who am i doing this for exactly because 
you know, it, it, and but um, it, this is why we do it because there are questions that need to be answered, and then this is just another one of these X files that we have to deal with. Yeah, just to point out too that this is Dan once again that uh, I was not a fan of Gray State. I didn't even know who that was or what that was, and I never heard of David Crowley in my life, and so I don't have a dog in this fight. Um, at all, and people ask, why are you so vested? Why are you so interested in a case that it has no impact um, on you? And I said, well, when it involves a five-year-old girl and a wife, an innocent family of three, um, brutally murdered, I said, I don't know if that sits well with you or not, but it, it certainly does not make, uh, it does not sit well with me. So that's uh, that's why we've been pushing this uh, ever since, and really keeping up on it and making sure this information gets out there because a lot of people don't know about it. But when we go to our various YouTube videos and our page, uh, some of the analytics is uh, is the majority of the sec – after the U.S., it's it's all Europe following this case. Uh, uh, Paris and France and London and Germany are very heavily influenced in this, and we've got members from all over – um, uh, last I checked, it was over 45 countries uh, of people following the case that are following this all around the world. So this is a big case, and like you said, it, they've done a good job to really suppress it here in the U.S. But um, the London, uh, the Daily News, UK, the, the Daily News is really one of the first articles that that even ha appeared in this uh, story about this Crowley case. And I live in Minnesota myself, uh, 30 minutes away from the crime scene, and I found out about from the Daily, the Daily Mail. <laughs> yeah, you see, I mean, it's, it's it's amazing how how suppressed such a big case that has so many loose ends. I mean, this, you know, forget about the Mueller report. Like this should have been on the mainstream media for like three months uh, with like breaking news, and you know, it's like. This, but you know it's a big case when they're making it a point not to talk about it. Very similar to like that shooting in Colorado. Uh, now you have a uh, like a transgender girl and an anti-Trump, uh, you know, uh, kid uh, that shot at the school, and now the mainstream media is not talking about it because it doesn't fit the narrative. It's not like a MAGA hat. All right, you know, and, and where they spend months on that, and and you know, with all the analysis and the political pundits weighing in, whereas you have this one doesn't fit the narrative. It's not a white supremacist. Uh, you know, we're not going to talk about that because we can't talk about trans people, this and that. And it's it, you know, so you, right there, it has nothing to do with this, but it's a good example of when something doesn't fit the narrative, they're just gonna you know, breeze over it. They're going to put out like one, two paragraph article with one photo. And just to say that, oh, we covered it, but no, you didn't. And uh, one of the big questions I have here, of course, being um, obsessed with the Bohemian Grove. I have uh, anti-Bohemian Grove tattoos all over my body. My band, all uh, Sacred Owls, of course, is all about our logo is the uh, you know, owl crossed out. And then so, you know, Greg knew I'd get a kick out of the one crime scene photo of, of, of Crowley's office, where it looks like he has a scale model of the 40-foot statue of an owl with, like, the moon altar uh, where they have the cremation of care ceremony where, of course, they sacrifice an effigy of a child to the flames every midsummer. Uh, to rid themselves of a conscience. And uh, when I first saw that photo, it reminded me of this meme that Dee's illustration put out years ago of the Bohemian, the Cremation of Care playset, and like a kid with a pentagram t shirt and green hair was like playing with, uh, you know, little action figures of Henry Kissinger and, and George Bush and stuff like that. Um, but that blew my mind. I was wondering why. Is there a scale model of this occult symbol of the secret society, which, mind you, is, is a secret society where global elites, uh, uh, United States political pundits, political figures, uh, ex and future presidents uh, have uh, talked. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, Manhattan Project was launched there. We had, you know, we talked about a lot of that on the last show. Um, and they've been involved in 
human trafficking, uh, rape and murder of children, and all kinds of heinous acts that, you know, kind of are, when I look at these crime scene photos, it feels very reminiscent to the, the stories being told by Paul Bonassi, Troy Boner, Alicia Owens, and the Franklin cover-up by John DeCamp, where, you know, blood is being, you know, things are being written on the walls, uh, bodies are being hacked up and placed in, in odd ways. Um, uh, the, he point, uh, Greg pointed out that uh, Crowley's hand was like uh, put into like a, a certain uh, a certain shape. It's kind of like the what like 4chan was trolling everyone like that's a white supremacist hand sign. But it's also like the Phi Beta Kappa, uh, of course, uh, uh, that Colin Kaepernick. Uh, uh, football player, he's a part of that. You know, so there's a lot of photos of a lot of celebrities and stuff with this kind of like AOK sign. And sure enough, his dead body has. I mean, dead bodies don't just die, and then your index finger curls up and and touches your your, your thumb with like your other three fingers extended. That's not a natural. Typically, it'll just kind of like close up all together. Uh, unless it's palm down, and then they would usually be all out, maybe slightly like pulled in from any crime scene photos I have. So I just wanted to talk about those two things. What do you make of the Bohemian Grove owl playset, as it were, uh, being at uh, you know at, in his office? And do you make it of anything with with that hand signal? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> okay, sorry, I was <laughs> I had to laugh at all at the whole thing. Okay. So there's either – so that owl being in the house is either a movie prop. It was something that was given to David. Um, I don't believe that it was something that he, like, worshipped. That was the other thing. So when I first saw that image, I had all of these different thoughts. And, it's like, the most logical one would be that it's a movie prop that he was going to use. Maybe that was going to be part of this whole – documents or the, uh, part of David's film that he was working on, you know? Um, but I really don't know the, uh, and, and it's not just about why it was there. It's about also who made that for him. That, to, that looks handmade. It's so, nice. And it looks, I mean, it's well it's very done. Detailed. Yeah. It's I mean, well it's done. Yeah, and, I have a background scale, in architecture. Because, I've done a lot of architectural scale models and I've seen so that's thousands. 40, foot, 40 feet. Yeah, and I've seen thousands of photos of uh, the actual owl and the altar close-up photos. Um, there's the, the videos shot by uh, employees of the Bohemian Grove that got released, I think, back in like uh, like 2005 to Infowars that they played, where you really get up close. They even have a video inside of the owl, and you can see. The effigy, like the skeleton, it's like a metal skeleton on like uh, on some wood, on wood planks that they use to carry it, and then they just wrap that all in like flammable probably fabric or or, or, or you know paper in order to, to burn it every time and reuse that same skeleton over and over again. And um, you know I can say like this is like somebody that like knew it, you you can't make something like that from from photos. And if you did, I mean, with that level of detail, I mean, you must have really spent some time looking at hundreds and hundreds of every, like, little angle, all of, like, the way the stone it's – it's not a usual shape, this owl. It's, it's more of, like, an obscured uh, – you know, it's not like you see, like, a very distinct bank, beak. It's really just, like, uh, a point they, – they designed this thing to almost look – like a weathered artifact of something that used to have more definition, very similar to like the Sphinx uh, or the, or the pyramids where thousands of years of sands have been beating against it. And now it's just kind of this uh, very amorphic shape of kind of like, a, you know, a, this owl shape. And uh, so, like, it was initially whoever built that thing for the Bohemian Grove designed it, you know, because once you go inside of it, once you see the video of going inside of it, you'll see that it's all just, like, rebar, welded, uh, chicken wire, 
uh, you know, facade, and then they used like a plaster or concrete mix on top of the chicken wire skeletal frame. Uh, so it's a movie set item. It's not like something that is actually this like chiseled stone sculpture, kind of like the Georgia Guidestones or something like that. This is something that is a, a movie prop uh, that is meant to look older than it is. And of course it's been there for, um, you know, probably close to a hundred years at this point. So it's already, you know, starting to look like what it's supposed to look like. But then with the altar, with the moon, the crescent moon in the front of it and all of this stuff, um, this is somebody, whoever designed that thing, uh, they must've had some kind of plans for it, or maybe were involved with the Bohemian Grove. Maybe this is something that was purchased from the Grove or like then sold on eBay. I mean, you could speculate all day, but this is not just something that is available for purchase. This is something that is very uh, specialized and very rare that, I, that none of us that have been researching this have ever seen before. And you have a good point that. Perhaps, you know, he, he, he's working on this film, uh, and that would be a great asset to have if you're going to be doing kind of like a pan over shot, uh, zooming in on, uh, you know, uh, the cremation of care. Maybe that was like going to be part of the film. And if that's the case, then, boy, that really is like pointing a lot of fingers again, at the Grove, and people involved to, to silence and shut this up. Because, hell, you look at, I mean, I, I've been researching um, Kevin Spacey and how he came out. Uh, we, we have a Dark Docs Digest uh, two-part uh, episode. We did two whole uh, half-hour episodes on uh, breaking down the last couple episodes of the season before the last season, because the last season, Kevin Spacey was already kicked off of the show. The allegations of uh, underage molestation of multiple children uh, was already uh, out and in the media, and Netflix wanted nothing to do with Spacey, kicked him off of the show, and that's why they just pretty much, between seasons, killed him off and made it like a weird murder mystery, and his wife became the president. Well, those last couple episodes of the season before last, Kevin Spacey's last episodes, sure enough, were at the fields of Elysia, where the crow of Elysia were, would uh, would uh, they sacrifice an effigy of a child to release common woe, and you know he's out there in the woods trying to um, you know trying to make deals, trying to get back into power and this and that, and you know, they, he's even called out that, of course, at the Bohemian Grove, they say weaving spiders come not here, which means journalists and people that are trying to spin deals and stuff. It's really supposed to be getting rid of all your cares. It's supposed to be two weeks of just cavorting, relaxing. They have this whole cremation of care to rid yourself of a conscience. And I mean, it's almost like a black magic, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, in Christianity, uh, like a baptism, where all of your sins are washed away, instead of washing it away in the waters of Christ, you know, they burn a child to burn your conscience, to burn your cares away. Uh, so it's quite literally the opposite of Christianity, what they do out there. And uh, But sure enough, when, when I saw that episode and I heard about it, I was thinking, oh, man, is Kevin Spacey, is Netflix kind of like throwing down? Or are they kind of uh, – and, and then uh, after like further analysis, and of course now you have uh, Barack Obama uh, working with Netflix, and I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right either. But yet, here we go. Now Kevin Spacey, he's uh, – you know, they're taking this case very seriously, and he might be facing some serious jail time. Um, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, whenever people bring up the Bohemian Grove in a negative light, something bad happens to them. So, like, that that's the first thing that, that struck me. Uh, Dan, do you have any, uh, any perspective on this? 
Well, I think <clears throat> once once again, it's we got two two things. We've got this uh, little model in his office, and I think that it was like Greg said, either given as a as a not as a gift, as a prank gift, or used as a prop. Now, David was very anti-Bohemian Grove, along with the uh, Federal Reserve <clears throat> and uh, Georgia Guidestones and the New World Order and the FEMA camps. He was against all these things, so there would be no way he would have that in good faith in his home. I wouldn't believe he would you know, would have pitched it out and gotten rid of it. But like you said, someone made it, a custom made it, and it's very detailed. Now, the other thing, I don't believe detectives – in Apple Valley, Minnesota, would have even known what that thing is. Uh, Normal, yeah, you know, true. the Normans would not even know what that thing is, and they wouldn't, you know, give it a second thought. But if they'd be putting all this together, uh, if you had true investigators out there, true detectives, um, they would know uh, that that David was involved in this kind of thing, and then start raising some of these questions. They also would know that David had just recently uh, shut down one of his other side businesses to focus on this project, and that side business was called the Bullet Exchange. It was a place that uh, took refurbished uh, gear, police gear, and military police gear, and used it for props and movies and, and kind of sold secondhand. So when he shut that down, he had his whole basement uh, closet, an extra bedroom, filled with this stuff. And so when uh, first first uh, people on the scene come in there, the, the law enforcement, they're going to see this all of this police gear and, and, and holsters and guns and ammunition and machining, machine gun lookalikes and things like this down laying on the floor. They thought, uh, once again, that this guy's a, a crazy nut job. But uh, he had just sold, sold that business and shut it down and, and had all this inventory he was trying to get rid of. So you have to really look at all the aspects of, of this whole case that uh, that bohemian grove uh, who knows what was there but someone spotted it it was maybe three years into the investigation one of our new members uh, stopped at that photo and says and zoomed in and started asking questions and that's the great thing about getting this this new new members on the page is that you get new eyes looking at things from a different perspective and they see things that we haven't and, and greg jumped on that right away and says well that's exactly right that is a miniature scale drawing of bohemian grove and, and why in the world would david have that now we haven't seen any evidence of uh any you know using that in any of his footage but then again um you know like the you know the movie was never actually made they just had this script and what they did was they did that uh crowd sourcing a crowdfunding to raise uh, sixty one thousand dollars the, the gray state and they put together a trailer before the movie was even made, and to this day the movie wasn't made. But they put all that money into a two- to three-minute trailer for The Gray State and then used that to pitch to Hollywood producers to you know, to see what they could get and, and sell it to them. So um, a lot of the confusion also in this case is that people are thinking, where is the movie? Where is the script? Uh, was it ever released? What happened to the movie? Well, they never, they never made it. And then while... David was working on this legal issue that he had with one of his uh, uh, co co-workers there, uh, Danny August Mason. Everything was kind of put on the back burner. Everything was tabled until he had that legal release. And so David then chose to focus on the documentary. Now, this is different. This is his documentary, not a gray state from Eric Nelson, but this is the, the gray state project documentary called The Rise. And that's a 90-minute documentary that they were wrapping up that david had planned to release on new year's i think it was new year's uh new year's eve or new year's day of 2015 and was putting the final touches on that and he was going to release that for free and i think that's the other thing we need to look at for the people looking to make money off this um, sean wright was the uh, the main producer of that documentary and um, took a lot of time off work i don't even know if he was working uh, at the time he was doing this as his full-time job and when it got out that uh, David was going to release this for free on YouTube just to get the word out there about uh, the new world order and what was going on here behind the scenes, uh, that didn't sit well with, with Sean Wright because he was thinking that they were going to sell that documentary, uh, The Rise, in, in stores, online, and everything else. And that was going to be his payday. So we've got him upset about the documentary danny august mason upset about the project itself that he was basically written out of and uh, you got all these things uh, going on to get this perfect storm while at the same time sean wright claiming that he was david 
Crowley's best friend, and they hung out and they did all these things together, and their kids played together. Um, Sean Wright's the one leaving on a Facebook post his cell phone number saying, call me when you get a chance because this is important about my tax stuff. And so right. uh, if you have his number, uh, and he d- could have would have known to just do an instant message, but by p- p- putting that out there on a public comment, his cell number yeah. saying, dude, call me. And, uh, and sure enough, that was in there. That tax stuff was in there. And after the deaths, uh, uh, Sean Wright did end up releasing that documentary called The Rise with nine minutes cut out of that production, including the tax talk. So we had a lot of uh, a lot of angst and anger and uh, and frustration by these main key players leading up to the deaths. And and Greg, you can vouch for this. Uh, after the family was found, the three bodies were found, mm-hmm. and before the funeral took place, uh, there was a lot of happy campers in this group. Uh, photos surfacing of everyone smiling. Uh, you know, uh, it's almost yeah. like a had been lifted from their back by having this family uh, killed. Well, at the same time, they were telling it's us like that we need, tour. we need time to grieve. These are our best friend that died, and we knew the family very well. Uh, quit making a mockery of the family and quit investigating it because uh, we need time to grieve. While the next day uh, we're seeing some of these same characters show up on t- television interviews and uh, alternate media interviews about this case, uh, looking like they hadn't lost a wink of sleep at all. So it was the behavior in the aftermath which was very a big indicator. And uh, and uh, one person, actually a cousin of David's, um, came in uh, anonymously to our group and said that, um, uh, and, and she said that that memorial service was very strange because the older brother Danny Crowley was uh, acting like this was some kind of a party, and everyone was happy and joyous and cracking jokes at the same time. And she said, I found that really disturbing to see all these guys in the Gray State Project all so excited and elated and as if a a monkey was off their back now because of this, uh, the family was killed. So they started, I think, digging their own hole around that point. And then they uh, ended up coming after us in the forms of uh, threats and shutting down the page and shutting down the group and um, demanding things. So it it got to be really, uh, really strange to say the least but uh yeah the the threats started coming in and then you know they were none too happy that we kept that page um up no they were trying to actually take over right you had a long period where they were trying to yeah the other right? the other for the for the new listeners out there there was a page called Justice for David Crowley uh, of Gray State and that was just a community where people could you know, join up and and talk about the case and the owner the runner of that the person who ran that page um started getting demands that uh, someone from the Gray State needs to be at needs to have administrative rights to that page so they can uh, ensure that the truth gets out versus um conspiracy theories and alternate narratives. They wanted to clean it up. So this person gave uh, rights to Danny, uh, I mean to uh, to Sean Wright, and I believe to Danny August Mason too. They, he, he allowed them both to be um, administrators on that Facebook page. And within two hours, large chunks of data was deleted and comments removed and threads were just wiped off of that page. And the next day, I started getting the requests from Danny August Mason and Sean Wright personally, instant messenger, saying you need to give us administrative rights to your page so we can ensure that the truth is uh, truth is out there versus all your stuff. And boy, when I said no, <laughs> the anger uh, it was the it was the day of the of the memorial service, the day of the huh. memorial service. I said, well, that'll be fine. I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys there because I'm looking forward to coming because I like the payment. Uh, condolences to the Crowley family and that was when Sean Wright said you better not dare show your face at that event we'll have security wow. there as out and to this day we haven't given access to that justice for David Crowley uh, and family Facebook page and we've kept and maintained the integrity of honest to goodness truth seekers running that show and Good. Um, to this day they've had multiple Facebook uh, profiles under different guises, um, fake accounts set up to try to get into that page and become a member, and then start the. De- and what they do is they just start derailing the conversation and throwing junk out there. So it's been a uh, a pretty good effort just to keep that page clean, 
with honest to goodness members versus uh, ones with ulterior motives. Well, yeah, I'm look I'm trying to find like an actual copy of um you know, and, and just, just to reiterate, um so you you're telling me that the bodies were found in October, was that correct? Uh January seventeenth. Oh, okay. What why why where did I get that October from? I thought that Oh, I I, cause I I remember in the documentary they said it was late October when the sister came and uh um, they were trying to trick you. They were trying to trick you with those dates, see? <laughs> yeah, you see, yeah, there you go. Um yeah, okay, so it w- it was January. Gotcha. And so they they did release the rise while he was still alive? No, There's no. Two. It was a year There's two. later, I think. It was a year later. Okay. All right. That's um, that it is out free, but it's it's got nine minutes uh, of key information removed from the version David Crowley had. Yeah, because uh, on YouTube, I'm just trying to find it now, and uh, there's yeah, this this is a rough cut, um, and then you have some people saying that this is not the re- real movie. Don't watch subliminal messages, weird soundtrack, and then there's like a whole thread under that, and uh, and then there's there's all these other ones that are like. They, they, it just seems like clickbait. Like I'm just trying to find like one that's you know legit. Do you guys have you guys seen it? Is there like an actual like decent copy of it out there? The or the the only good one, Greg, is called uh, I think it's the Rise dot uh, Wiki is the official one. But there hasn't they don't have it set up. Uh, Google yeah. Analytics, and it's a poorly done page, so there's not a lot of traffic drawn to that at all, the actual one, which I've seen it myself. That's a, actually a pretty good documentary, and um, and it should be seen by, by a lot of uh, people. It's a very anti-NWO, anti-Federal Reserve, Georgia Guidestones, Bohemian Grove type of thing, um, bankers. And so that's a good uh, documentary, but it's not out there. So when you do a search for it, you're seeing all this other uh, crap that's showing up in the search results and that does need to be cleaned up because uh, there's there's a lot of true conspiracy theories out there. Well, I I I mean, Dan, you've you've seen both of them, so you've seen. I mean, all of us have probably seen, um, not all of us, but there's many of us who have seen the rough cut and this one that was put out. After yeah, I've the, seen them both. Yeah. Right. So I mean, that's that's the other thing, right? Is there's two different ones and. And the one that was, uh, I'm going to jump on a different phone here. My phone's going to go dead. The one that got out there that got leaked, there's actually one version that got leaked. The original one that David did that still had Sean Wright's tech stuff in there, it was called the Rough Cut. That one was anytime someone mirrored it or copied it or threw it up onto YouTube as an actual video. Yeah. Um, that got. Uh, pull down due to copyright infringement. And guess who was doing the copyright infringement? Oh, they got him. Yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> guess who was doing the copyright infringement? And that would be Sean Wright. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see uh, the Rise uh, Wiki, and they have the full movie on here. It's uh, an hour and fifty-eight minutes and five seconds. Um, and then there's mm-hmm. one uh, that looks like it's uh, in Spanish, and that's like two hours and 41 minutes. There's the rough cut one, two hours and 39. Um, now, that, and, that, it, that one, the rough cut was put out right after David died. So right after David died, there was one guy who put that out, and then it, it spread – and then he got in trouble, and he took it down. But by that time, it was already yeah, out all, there. That's, that's why I love the internet. That's how we have conspiracy <laughs> of violence. Dark we would have never had. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, we should be, never, that should be in Dark Dog. <laughs> what the rough cut? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. then that that's exactly why I'm looking for it now. Because when we're done with this, it's going on Dark Dog. I'm going to download it upload it to our server so when they scrub all of these from YouTube 
we're going to have a backup copy, and then they're going to have to come <laughs> knocking down our door. Nice. You know, because uh, you know, that, that's, that's why we made DarkDocs.com, because you can't rely on these third-party streaming services. Uh, once, you know, once they pull that video off of Netflix, once they pull that video off of YouTube and you just can't get it anymore, if you don't have a hard copy, that's it. And then they can just say, you know, it can just disappear if no one backed it up. And, you know, and that's why I think all of us truth seekers with our external hard drives after external hard drives is backed up with this stuff. You know, we really all need to get together and throw it all up on the Dark Doc server because we have infinite bandwidth. Uh, GoDaddy cannot mess with us legally as long as the videos aren't, you know, snuff films, of course, so showing uh, actual acts of, of crime. But, of course, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to archive news reports, documentaries, and things that can be used as evidence in future criminal cases. We're really just trying to be a library, you know, and we're not trying to, we're, you know, the videos we, don't, we have, some of them are kind of shocking, but it's not for shock value. And we make it a point uh, to not censor anything. So uh, if something is censored on YouTube, it gets the, the, the YouTube badge of honor. This, is, this video has been banned on YouTube. We'll slap that on the thumbnail. Um, but yeah, uh, and that's, you know, that's what, exactly what we're going to do. So I'm glad to see that um, because uh, you can download some, some stuff from Vimeo, but this doesn't have any links on the, the rise.wiki. Uh, forward slash the rise movie. Um, it, this might be actually hosted on there, and that's pretty difficult to download unless you do a screen capture, and that's kind of crappy. But I, I do see one that is the right length, and it starts off the same way. So hopefully we can drag that off of uh, Tony Mahoney's uh, YouTube channel. Tony, this, <laughs> Tony Mahoney. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it says wow. Tony Mahoney with an H. Yeah. Tony Mahoney. Okay. All right. Yeah, All right, Tony, Tony Mahoney yeah, well, has an actual good quality copy on his uh, oh. on his page, uh, whereas the Gray State doesn't even have it on theirs, which I find odd. If you release this thing, why don't you even have – you would think you would want the, the traffic. You would want the hits. Because it's civil war yeah. because there's factions. They have factions. The, the whole Gray State team – there are factions, there are fights, there are legal battles. There's all this stuff behind the scenes going on. And that was probably what, what was going to happen with David Crowley and Danny Mason. So even if David Crowley was able to create this, was able to make this into a TV series, into like a Game of Thrones, you know, whatever, like a police state Game of Thrones thing or, or something, even if they were going to do that, they would have had some legal troubles possibly from Danny Mason, possibly. I mean, I, I hope this is making the New World Order very happy that, you know, we can't, we can't get anything done. I mean, and when I say we, I don't mean resist the Grove and Dark Docs. We're actually operating fantastically as just three or four people. But, you know, if, if one of us gets whacked, like, boy, would that, like, mess things up. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I like being very transparent about operations in that, you know, you're looking at it, buddy. You know, it's just this. Whereas you have all these people that are claiming to, like, unite the masses of the world to destroy the new world order. But, like, they're suing each other? And <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, I would never they want see to replace. Right? Yeah, well, they want to have... Because they're doing board. it for money. So. They're, they're scumbags. They're <laughs> yeah. doing it for money. And, um, and, and I, you know, I, I got to be real. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. man, if, if David Crowley and his family were murdered by some scumbags or, like, people involved in the project that were trying to take his money, that's despicable. And, and, and I, I can't imagine that he actually did this. I can't imagine he, the official narrative that he just snapped and stuff like that. But even David Crowley himself, like, man, I, I'm not trying to knock a dead man. You know, really, I'm trying to be as sensitive mm -hmm. as possible. But I would never record talks where, like, I'm practicing to, like, pitch to Hollywood producers about, like, how – 
you know, you know, all oh, like the stupid libertarians. Uh, they're eating this, like you know, they, they have the hook, line, and sinker. I mean, we have their, they, we have their wallets, man. Like, I would never say shit like that on tape. Are you nuts? You know, and and I'm trying to rationalize it in my head. Like, okay, so well, let me think about it. Those are on the video clip. Those uh, are, yeah, no. that's what he's. Yeah, dude. And, I'll and, 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 yeah, I have to go back and watch that. Yeah, go, go on Netflix and watch your audio phone. only. Audio. I, Are you back? I really yes, don't want to watch that. It, 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 it's heartbreaking because, damn, it's like if we were like in, in a courtroom. Right, go back and watch that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we were in a courtroom and then you know the other lawyers played that video and I had to like you know now you know like the prosecutors and okay. now I'm the defendant, I'd be like. Uh, objection, that is very damaging to my argument, like in liar, liar. Well, I would, like, I would, I would, awful. I would ask for, for, for the footage that actually contradicts that. And, and, and I would weigh that footage. I would take his social media posts. I would take all of the things that he said positively. Yeah. I, I would take all of that and I would use that to counter it. And I would also look at all of the whole and, and I mean, you know, all of us would too. We're all you know, we would look at everything uh in its proper context from start yeah. to finish. Not just right. take a little clip here, a little clip there, because we know that's the that's one of the biggest signs. When they just take a little thing here, a little thing there, and they try to build a house of cards, that that yeah. house that's falls. Awesome. Yeah. You can't you can't do that. Go ahead. And also to be fair um, I, I'm I'm he, I, I'm here sitting here listening to this like trying to rationalize. Well, if I were, if there was a sound clip of me, if I was David Crowley saying such things, why would I say them? If I didn't really believe that, and it's like, well, he is pitching to Hollywood producers, and I'm sure him of all people knows how corrupt and. You know, they don't give a shit about the message. They don't care. It's not like InfoWars, you know, where, I mean, some people even say Alex Jones is like a shill and doesn't really, you know, care. And he's just doing it to sell, you know, ultra male vitality, yada, yada. Um, But if I were, you know, going into the belly of the beast, going to Hollywood and talking to like these, like, you know, talking to pedophile Steven Spielberg and, you know, to try to green light and direct this to make it a big Hollywood blockbuster, I'm going to act like a scumbag. I'm going to go in there and, and be like, ah, you know, I don't buy any of this stuff, but you have this target demographic with, you know, huge uh, disposable incomes that will go to the movie that will buy all the merchandising that was, you know, so, and in order to sound convincing, if David Crowley is as, um, you know, control freak or uh, methodical and, you know, has to, he he figures everything out. He's very OCD. Well, then he's like, well, man, if I'm going to be lying through my teeth to these Hollywood producers, maybe I should record, he recorded everything. So maybe I should record these conversations, you know, and how I'm pitching it. Cause you even hear him, he'll say one thing and then he'll be like, no, 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 don't, that's not the right word. He's talking to himself. Like he'll interrupt himself talk to himself and be like, no, I would say it this way. And so he's like, he's crafting this personality of this sociopath that doesn't care. And they're just all about the money. And man, now that I'm, I'm saying it out loud, you know, that sounds more plausible than actually thinking that he, you know, would do such a thing. And then again, they cut it out of context. And then they showed it to the people that he was pitching to, and then they feel insulted, you know, because here this person is trying to, um, you know, trying to manipulate them, you know, like imagine it, Greg, if I was like, you know, if, if you know, these recordings of Christian Coffins being like, oh, when I talk to Greg Fernandez, you know, I'm going to act like I really care about the Bohemian Grove, and you know, when we meet, I'm going to, you know, it's like. Like, man, that would make you really wonder for a second. And in your gut instinct, right when you hear that, you'd probably be like, oh, fuck, Christian's a shill, you know? And you would have every right to in, the, in that first moment. And again, like, I saw that and I, I, I rewatched it today. 
And I should have clipped some of that stuff so we can actually talk about it. I mean, but if we're going to be making this documentary, yeah. we're, we're going to do that in the but, future anyway. Um, but, yeah, yeah but man, there that's, is, there, that's more there plausible. Is, there is one know. thing. I mean, there is one thing on that, too, because that's not where the whole story ends. Because uh, Dan was talking about how – and, Dan, are you are you back with us? I'm back, yep. I don't know. Okay. Correct. Can you talk about um, uh, at the – when this film uh, showed up, I think it was at the Walker Theater, and they had a Q&A, and um, I think Eric, Eric Nelson had to kind of backtrack and kind of show us that even that scene was taken out of context. It was twisted. Yeah, they did a uh, premiere. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can they, okay. Yeah. So they did, uh, after the, it, they made its rounds, that movie, that documentary, went to about 15 different film festivals, including Tribeca and Australia and, and, and Europe. And they pushed it as a – also nominated it as a uh, do, the documentary of the year uh, for the Oscars. <laughs> it didn't, really? didn't win, of course. But that's how they pitched it. Now, then they did a – because it's in Minneapolis, it's, it's based, they did a world uh, – basically a premiere at a theater – at the Walker Art Center here in Minneapolis, and they did a Q&A after the viewing of the show, and Eric Nelson, the director, answered some questions, and some other folks were there as well to answer. And so most of the questions were just normal types of uh, normie, normie questions, but a couple he got hit with a couple of good questions, and he had to backtrack. Um, I was not there, but uh, he did have to backtrack because he was sending conflicting messages on how he was going um, to do this, uh, did he want to, you know, answer it and bring, a, you know, bring closure to the case? No, but he wanted to give all sides of the story and have the viewer leave the theater with their own thoughts and their own perceptions as to what possibly could have happened. And uh, like, like we've stated earlier, that obviously was not the case because uh, it was a lot of yeah, yeah. during the entire movie planting certain seeds at certain spots. Um, so when you left there, you basically was cemented the fact that he did it, and he's a, he's a crazy nut job. But like Greg mentioned earlier, most of the traffic on our Justice Facebook page now for new members is people who watch the documentary. That's what's driving the most people. It seems that if you're awake and watching that documentary, it jumps out as you as uh, something does not make sense. But the normies watch it, and they you know go home, and, and their day is done. Uh, they don't think twice yeah. about it. But we're getting a lot of traction on our page from people who watch that documentary, uh, specifically like yourself, uh, Christian. Well, I love it, man, because, uh, you know, and again, there's no such thing as bad publicity where, um, you know, you guys got railroaded in this thing, yet you, now you're seeing the spoils of war, where here we are now, now we're going to put out the real documentary through Dark Docs, and now you have people watching it on Netflix, that that are semi woke or woke, and they're like, ah, oh, you know, that doesn't make sense. I'm gonna, you know, start truth seeking, and they're bound to found your endless stuff, uh, you know, on on your your websites. Again, there are links, uh, GregFernandezJr.com. Uh, Dan, do you have like your own website on all this, or just the Facebook? Yeah, mine stuff? is yeah, mine is www.uglytruth.info, and I have a uh, playlist uh, on YouTube as well, my Dan Hennen channel. And that that consists of 44 videos, all on the Crowley case. That's fantastic, and, and it's great to be working with you now. You're a regular on Internal Affairs Media. I imagine we're going to be doing a lot of work together, so uh, I'm glad we get along. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, we covered a lot today in, in these two hours. Uh, we got about a minute left. Any last notes from you guys? No, nope, I'm good. No, no, I, I think that was pretty that solid. I just wanted to wrap up the show by saying I did uh, did hire a private investigator to look in this uh, into this case back in February, and so he's still pouring through the notes. And we should have results here in the next couple of months. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to go ahead and play the the tune out music. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll we'll be talking soon, guys. All right, thanks.
If you find value in these broadcasts, please invest in your education and sanity at Eternal Affairs Media and DarkDocs.com. We hope the information you received was beneficial to your quest for truth and justice. Please visit us online at DarkDocs.com to download shows, movies, other podcasts, CBS documents, music, and much more for free. No advertisement, no sign-ups, no terms of use, no censorship, no control. This is information warfare. This is the end of the transmission.